Good Sunday morning and welcome to WGN TV Political Report. I'm Paul Lisnick. Early voting now underway in Chicago and across Illinois. And today we're taking you inside the race for Illinois controller. Democrat Susana Mendoza has held the role for six years, is seeking a second full term this November as the state's chief fiscal officer. The controller manages the state's checkbook. During her time in the office, Mendoza has helped pay down Illinois' $16.7 billion bill backlog, fought for transparency in the state's finances. She's facing a challenge from Republican Shannon Teresi. But for now, incumbent controller and Democrat Susana Mendoza joins me this morning to talk about her bid for another term. Madam Controller, good to see you. It's so great to see you, Paul. So for folks who you've been around a long time, but for folks who may not know your background, Bolingbrook, Truman State, give us a quick synopsis. Sure. Well, I was a when you say Bolingbrook and Truman State, I automatically think of soccer, right? <laughs> it was so fun. I was a soccer player, went to college on a soccer and academic scholarship at Truman State University, um, and uh, then went on to eventually become elected to the state legislature. I was elected six terms, uh, but the first year when I won in 2001, when I was sworn in, I was just the ripe old age of 28 years old, the youngest member in the chamber at that time in that legislative session. And then I was elected um, six times total, then became the first woman elected city clerk of the city of Chicago, where it was great to be a historic, um, you know, to do something historic, but the most important thing was what I did to change the way people bought their city stickers, which in and of itself was the most historic and transformative thing we did to make people's lives better. They didn't have to wait three to four hour long. Meaning in getting line. it online and all that. Yeah, so you can get it online now in your pajamas right. if you want, you know, <laughs> but, but the point is we got rid of the three to four hour long lines, made it into a year round system and Instead of just purchasing all these crazy stickers once in one month of the year. And then I took the experience that I learned there managing a large executive office and doing transformative things with it into running for controller in 2016 when I was elected to fill out the remaining two years of Judy Bartopinka, right. who was awesome her term, and then was elected to a full term of four years. Uh, and then now I'm seeking my, my third term. And we're going to talk about your plans and what you have done. The role of the controller, I already said, is the state's chief fiscal officer. You manage the checkbook. But the truth is, you need a budget to pay the checks. Of what course. role do you play when it comes to that legislative budget process? So I walked into the controller's office on day 523 of what ended up being a 736-day budget impasse. That means no budget. And with no budget, the controller has a very difficult time paying bills. You can only pay bills that had already been appropriated for in prior budgets. So long story short, we had a $16.7 billion backlog of unpaid bills that it was my job to navigate through to pay them down. And I had less than $60,000, Paul, in our state's rainy day fund. That's not enough to cover 30 seconds worth of government operations. So that is what the, the cards that I was dealt, right? They were pretty horrific, but I knew what I signed up for. And I promised to not just pay down that bill backlog, which I've done. Today, we actually have an accounts payable of $2 billion. But I did it without using a penny of federal stimulus money because because we hadn't even received the ARPA dollars yet by the time I paid down our bill backlog. So you did, the, the bills got as bad, backlog $16.7 billion, I think as I said in 2017, and our credit rating was just one notch above junk. Where are we today? So before I took office, the prior administration had received eight consecutive credit downgrades during the best economic bull market of our lifetime. Should have been criminal. I was dealt the worst financial crisis, and I delivered not just one, two, three, four, or even five, but now six full credit upgrades, by the way, in the middle of a global pandemic. It doesn't get better than that. Your opponent says the way you got those bills paid down was because you relied on federal pandemic relief money, which totaled about $185 billion when you include everything, stimulus checks and aid to, to uh, local banks and schools, paycheck protection programs and such. So is it because of the federal money? No, of course not. I hadn't even received the federal money yet. And to say that, you know, I know she's launched this number about $185 billion that includes money to pretty much every single well, that person came from her campaign. in Illinois. I know, I'm using her number. Uh, that's money that went to local municipalities, to lo local governments, to individual people. That would be like me saying that I paid down the bill backlog because I took money out of your account, Paul, because you received federal stimulus. So that's not how it works. It shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of controller and where finances come from. 
I know what I'm doing. I think voters have known that, which is why over 2 million, almost 3 million people have voted to elect me uh, the last two times I've come up. She was appointed to office, has very little experience, and clearly just is unaware of what the role is or the facts. And we'll hear from her later. Um, what have you done? So if you were not controller now or later, what, would, what have you done that would ensure that any controller can carry on what you've been doing in terms of the protections? And what I have in mind is the Debt Transparency Act and some of those kind of steps. Sure. Well, thanks for saying that. When I first got elected and had to manage through $16.7 billion, you'll be shocked to know that I couldn't, ha I didn't have, I had no visibility on the liabilities that were being incurred by the state. So instead of just operating the way every other controller before me had, which is under old set of rules that made no sense, um, I said we have to change that. And so I passed legislation called the Debt Transparency Act. It's the largest fiscal transparency reform in the history of Illinois finances. It's been stated by the credit rating agencies on multiple occasions as one of the factors that led to our credit upgrades. And what it does is it allows me to see all of the state's liabilities at the agency level. They have to report to me monthly how many bills they're sitting on, how old they are, are they 0 to 30, 30 to 60 days old, 60 to 90. After 90 days, we start to accrue late payment interest penalties. So I need to know how many bills are accruing those penalties. Without that level of visibility, which any CFO at any company should already have, but Illinois did not, no controller could do their job well. So I have absolutely transformed this office in a way that will be beneficial for future controllers, although I hope that the future one in this cycle continues to be me. And so you also created a vendor payment program. It allowed third-party investors to purchase unpaid bills. They would get the interest down the line. Some investors uh, were upset saying, well, the principal's getting paid, but we're not. Is there an update on that? So number one, I did not create that program. That was created by CMS, and it was under a different governor. And um, I think that that program, while it was a necessary evil during the budget impasse because there was no budget so people were hemorrhaging their businesses um, they created this essential third-party entity that ended up for example I'm the third-party lender and you're the business who hasn't been paid in 210 days which was the average payment delay when I took office they would say to you you're bleeding your business isn't going to survive I will give you 90 percent of what you're owed but I get to keep all the interest that the state of Illinois owes you and potentially will negotiate on the extra 10 percent so we'll give you your money now but you're only getting a part of your money. It, it really kind of created this like third party, almost like a predatory lending mechanism. And by paying down the bills the way I have, which we now don't have a bill backlog anymore, mm -hmm. it's gone. It really eliminates the need for this program. So You, you also got the Truth in Hiring Act in and uh, it had to do with deceptive hiring practices of governors. Yep. What did that do? Of both parties. Yeah. So governors of both parties uh, would historically want to underreport how many employees they actually had working for them. So what they would do is they wanted people to think, oh, look, they cut their budgets. And so what they didn't really, they technically cut their budget on paper, but they were, they were taking um, employees who were assigned to other agencies, for example, the state police. And they would say, even though these employees are on the state police budget, we're going to have them report to the governor's office. But it was off the book. And so I think that we need to be transparent as to how many employees each state agency has, including the governor's office. And we should not continue the practice of offshoring employees, which means taking critical employees from other state agencies, pretending that they work for the state agency, but in fact taking them off the streets or off of dealing with children uh, and working then for the governor, but pretending you're not paying mm -hmm. for them. So honest budgets matter, transparency matters, and I've been the controller to deliver that. Just real quickly, the candidates for treasurer and your opponent all think controller and treasurer offices should be combined. They were separated by the Constitution of 1970. You don't feel that way. Why not? No, because they were separated for a reason. So back in 1956, there was one individual who did those duties of controller and treasurer combined. It was a big mistake because Mr. Orville Hodge embezzled. You'll be shocked to know this is Illinois, unfortunately, <laughs> here. But Mr. Hodge embe embezzled uh, $6 million, which today would be equivalent to about 59, close to $60 million. He went to jail. But obviously, the person who had access to the money should not have had access to the checkbook. So um, if you think this can't happen again, it did in 2012 with Rita Crundwell in Dixon, Illinois, who was also combined uh, duties of treasurer and controller. She embezzled $54 million, today the equivalent of $60 million. So the two largest government embezzlement schemes in the history of the United States of America happened here in Illinois, where the controller and the treasurer functions were held by the same person. Lastly, 
the credit rating agencies have already said that they would see a consolidation of the offices as a loss of internal controls yeah. and therefore would be a credit negative, which would cost us hundreds of millions of dollars in increased interest payments. All right, current controller and Democratic candidate for controller in the next election, Susana Mendoza, thank you for being with me. I appreciate your Thanks time Thanks for this having morning. me, and I hope I can count on the voters to send me back to keep working hard for them. Thank you. We're going to take our first break. Coming up next on WGN TV Political Report, Republican challenger Shannon Teresi joins me. Hear her plan for the controller's office when we come back. The candidates for governor go head-to-head. -head. More on the Illinois governor's debate. Don't go anywhere.